This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where I'm speaking to Dr. Mike Edwards, Chief Listening Officer at Sound Matters, a company focused on using sound and listening to create more sustainable and resilient futures. Sound Matters provided the soundtrack to the Rewild in Britain Garden that won Best in Show at this year's Chelsea Flower Show. Mike recently spoke passionately about climate change, soundscapes and landscapes at the Beth Chateau Symposium and wowed a lecture theatre full of rapt listeners with his prowess on the didgeridoo. The interview begins with me asking Mike about his work. I have a number of roles. I run an organisation called Sound Matters, which basically explores the role of sound listening in ways to connect people to nature, the more than human world. So how can we use sound and listening as a way forward to address the sort of environmental crisis we face? And then I also programme lead on the arts and ecology course at Dartington Trust, Dartington Arts down in Devon. Wow, that sounds like the course I would love to do. What an amazing combination of things. Okay, so going back to the kind of the landscape and how that ties in with sound, how does it tie in with sound and how can it affect the way that we kind of live in and develop landscapes? Really good question. And I I suppose I need to go back a little bit to when I first realized the importance of sound in landscape. And that was that was when I was studying and working in Australia. And I became fascinated by the landscape and also by the way Aboriginal people connected to that landscape. And a lot of that connection I realized was around listening. So it was a very important part of their their way of connecting to the, the more than human world and, and to one another, um, the ways of connecting to country. It was all about, yeah, the importance of listening. Listening was for survival. It was for day-to-day living and also for celebration. So I, I just became absolutely fascinated with the power of listening. And of course, when you're listening, you're listening to and for sounds. And that's when I started to become very interested in sort of the power of sound. But at that time, I didn't really know it was sound that I was interested in. It was just this ability to connect through listening. And what, as I say, what I saw Aboriginal people do when they did listen and when they did connect. And of course, that's not true for everyone in Australia. But when you could really sense that deep connection, it often came down to a deep listening and a deep reverence for landscape through that listening. And I suppose I'd been working, I've been working in climate change for many years and getting absolutely fed up with our inability to take action. And this was in the sort of the nineties and late nineties. So, you know, at that time, one was really banging one's head against a brick wall to get anyone to take notice of sort of environmental crises like climate change. I got a bit disenfranchised from the whole climate change discourse and became utterly fascinated with how you'd go about changing hearts and minds. And that's when the listening piece really came into it. And that, interestingly, when I when I really started listening to the landscape, it was the first time I became truly connected to the Australian landscape, because whilst I love it, I never felt really connected to it. And it was only through listening and then subsequently playing Yadaki didgeridoo that I really, really felt a deep connection. So that's where I suppose I started to realise the importance of sound and listening for connecting people to landscape. I think there's probably so many reasons why we have got a few steps removed from connecting to our landscapes through sound. I guess one of them is that the soundscape for most of us is so busy. And the other one is that it's become a kind of sense that we don't have to rely on maybe quite so much for survival. So kind of bearing all of those things in mind, 
how can we better connect with the soundscape moving forward? Are there kind of techniques that we can use? Because I think a lot of people will find it really hard to rediscover that skill of actually listening. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's it's true because the soundscape, you know, the many of us exist in nowadays, modern soundscapes are dominated by what we call the anthropophony. So the the sounds of humans and we were just then discussing where we live you know in the southeast of england for example it's very difficult to have a biophony to exist in a biophony which is largely you know sounds created by the natural world it can be very difficult to find that so actually exploring this idea of deep listening and what sound matters me and harry code my business partner in Sound Matters, we've developed a technique called integral listening, which is meant to sort of heighten people's awareness to the soundscape and to get them to connect so that they understand the processes that are shaping their world. So in a sense, it's not saying that the biophony is more important than the anthropophony. It's just helping people to realize that, yeah, these processes that are occurring in the landscape have a profound impact on them and on the landscape we actually try and teach people processes of listening we do a lot of recordings of the soundscape to try and heighten people's awareness of those processes that shape it we create sound installations sound pieces so it's really become a meditation on sound and of course this idea that by listening you connect to these processes be they good or bad. So I think, although it's such a simple thing just to say to people, hey, listen and connect, in practice, it's not that easy. There is a technique. And that's what Sound Matters is trying to do, trying to teach people to listen, to create a listening revolution. And how do you go about that? I mean, I I don't expect you to reveal all your trade secrets or go into every last part of your business, but how do you do that to connect people to the soundscape? Yeah, so we do it through practical things like workshops. So we run workshops, we teach. So a lot of my work at Dartington, when it comes down to it, it's about teaching people to listen. So getting people to undertake different sort of arts practices to use listening as a fundamental basis of that. So we do that. We also, I mean, we've got a large um, project in Spain at the moment where we're actually in negotiations at the moment as to how big an area we're going to be working with. But the idea there is to actually restore the soundscape of that part of Spain. And through that, we work with local musicians. As I said, we create installations Uh, sound installations which can sort of be used to show people what the soundscape could be like if the restoration processes were successful so really just trying to open people's ears open people's ears to the possibility of what could be there and also importantly what's been lost and we did this at the Chelsea Flower Show with Urquhart and Hunt who won best in show So we work with them to explore what a rewilded soundscape would sound like. And through that process, it's been very interesting that people have all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wow. You know, so you introduce a species into a landscape and all these other outcomes can occur very much around sound. So you hear the sound of different species that you may not have heard before and may have been extinct in this country for many, many years. So it's an engagement process. And as I say, we use many different techniques to do that. It's such an interesting thing. I was talking to someone today and I was trying to describe the taste of black currants, which for me, I'm trying to say they're like being in a box underground and it makes no sense. And it's not really what I'm trying to say, but I can't describe flavors and I can't do it with smells either and we don't seem to have the language to describe the world in anything other than really visual terms which is such a weird thing I don't know why that sense has taken such dominance and I'm sure you would know more about the theory behind that but in order to fall in love with a soundscape of a landscape 
we probably need to get better at identifying the elements in it. And I think an important part of that is being able to maybe recognise or see patterns in or even to name those elements. And I think that we don't do that. And I wouldn't even know where to start in order to do that. I mean, if I was to record a soundscape in this area, the obvious thing is that people would say, well, this is that bird and this is that bird. And there are apps that you can use to identify the birds. But beyond that, it's very, very difficult to name sounds. I mean, obviously you would have resources, but, but how do standard people go about naming the sounds in the gardens? Basically, what we find one of the most powerful methods is a simple sound walk. Um, we've done this with a number of groups where actually we blindfold students, <laughs> then send them off into dangerous environments. No, we, um, we sort of blindfold students so that they're aware of the heightened sensations from the soundscape. And by this, it, it doesn't have to mean, because people, also people who may have um, hearing problems or something, can still still listen. That's the beauty of sound. It's because it's a vibration. You are actually being touched by these sound waves. So it's not just relying on ears. It's a, it's a whole body sensation. To start with, it's not so much needing to name, say, different species. It's more just becoming very aware of that soundscape, where the sounds come from, what are the sound sources? What stories are the sounds telling? And I think that's so key. And this is very key to our integral listening sort of concept is that if you hear a plane, for example, going over now for one person, that may signify, you know, a fear of flying, uh, an absolute terror. So they will be like anxious because they hear this sound. Another person may be like, oh yeah, you know, brilliant playing off to Ibiza, going to a dance party, sort of having a great time. So these different sounds have different meanings and, and we attach meaning to those sounds. So they don't just occur without our own values and baggage sort of embedded on them. And for me, because I've always been interested in, say, birds and birdsong, my soundscape and my experience of the soundscape and the birds I hear often leads to great sadness because I hear just a few dominant species. Whereas, say, when I was a kid, you know, you would wake up to this amazing um, dawn chorus. Now, if you're lucky, you might still get that. But say where I live now, if you're lucky, you'll hear a song thrush, maybe a blackbird. But generally, you'll hear gulls, you'll hear crows. You'll hear, you know, magpies, you know, these dominant species. And so I suppose it's about being, again, it's about being aware of what are the stories that are shaping those soundscapes. And you, as I say, you don't need to necessarily name everything, but your awareness becomes heightened because you're listening. And I've done this, as I say, with a number of people who come out of this with a profound sort of change in perspective. Because as you say, we live in a culture that is dominated by the visual. You know, social media is visual. And then taking people into this space where they can explore with different senses, I think that in itself is profoundly important. During um, lockdown, I was doing a, quite a bit of sound recording around here, and it was fascinating because one would go out and people would say, oh, what are you doing? You know, because you always look a bit strange when you're carrying a, a shotgun mic and wearing headphones. And I was just like, I'm just recording the soundscapes of lockdown. Nearly everyone I spoke to said, oh, yeah, the birds. There are so many more birds around. And it's like, no, there aren't. You know, the birds haven't gone on some sort of crazy breeding frenzy because it's lockdown. It's just you can hear them. The anthropophony, the human sounds have been dulled. And what you're hearing is the biophony. So the bird song, you're becoming more aware of it. But that's the thing. People's comments were very much around that. There's so many more birds. There's so, no, it's just you're, you're able to hear them. And also there's been, there have been some interesting studies recently about how bird song did change during lockdown and the fact that birds found it easier to communicate during that time so it's just about opening yourself up to different possibilities different sources of knowledge and the soundscape is a massive uh, repository of knowledge which we just we ignore 
In terms of landscape design, because if we are designing a landscape, naturally it's humans that are having the guiding hand. How can we use sound to input into that creative process to create landscapes that we wouldn't see otherwise, given the fact that we just design from a visual perspective? I mean, this comes to the heart of the work Sound Matters is doing in Spain on this soundscape restoration work. I have to say it's been a real struggle in a good way to think about how you would design a landscape according to what you wanted it to sound like rather than what you wanted it to look like. And I suppose one thing that we've become very aware of is the fact that designing it through how you want it to sound could potentially make it look really rubbish. So visually it could look terrible, but from a sonic perspective, it would be alive. And if you think about many biodiverse environments, they don't always look great. I suppose what we've been doing in Spain is working with ecologists, working with local people to sort of find out what species would have lived there. What are the species that are indicators of resilience? So what would you expect to hear in this landscape? Trying to then design the landscape so you hear those indicator species or at least you're creating the environment for them to return so it's still obviously it still has a visual element but what's driving it is the species you want to hear and also importantly the cultural sounds one of the things i mean my business partner harry code has been working extremely hard with local musicians to almost bring those sounds back into the environment as well so it becomes this sonic palette that you're working with rather than thinking, and I have to say, this probably shows my ignorance of landscape design, but you're not thinking of the aesthetics from a visual perspective. You're thinking of the aesthetics from a life perspective. And this project is actually called Soundscapes of Life. I think that's the key. It could look really rubbish, but it might be just so alive. I suppose this is a new area and that's what we're exploring. You know, A, does it work? Can you use uh, soundscape design to do this? And B, what are the outcomes likely to be? And what are the indicators of success? Because visually, an indicator of success will be, yeah, it looks nice. People like it. But with what we're doing, it may be harder. It may be that we do have to do sort of biodiversity analysis we have to think, what are the indicators that we're using to see if what we're doing has had a beneficial impact on the landscape? It's fascinating stuff. It really is. And I can't wait to see how it develops. At the risk of alienating some of my audience, if I wanted to write a good pop song like Ed Sheeran, I might go, well, I know I need this and I know I need that. And I'll throw them all together and I'll come out with something that majority of people aren't offended by and, and sort of them actually like. If you were doing a landscape built on that, you know, are there elements that you would bring to it? You know, what does a good landscape sound like? Yeah, I, I mean, I would like to add that we are hoping to work with Urquhart and Hunt on this project because we are aware that we can't, as soundscape designers, do all the work together. So working with landscape designers who know about sort of rewilding, whatever, is very important. And that's, that's the beauty of this. It is a collaborative process. In terms of the elements, what we've really worked out is that, A, you have to understand the dominant processes shaping an environment or a landscape. If you're working in an industrial or urban sort of environment, the elements you need are going to be very different from if you're working in a, a more wilder sort of natural landscape. Where we are in Spain, it's dominantly agricultural. It's been intensively farmed for olives and almonds to the point that the soil has been completely mined. And is dead in many ways, pretty much dead. So the way we're starting there is with the soil. And what we're trying to do is use sort of, I suppose, monitoring techniques, but sonic monitoring techniques. And again, this is one thing that Harry has been working on is 
we call it an e-composer and we take data from the soil we take data from the landscape and we use that to create data we turn that data into signals which can trigger instruments virtual instruments and so we start to explore how the soil changes how its sound changes as it's restored and we use certain soil quality indicators etc what we're going to do is develop that so we have a proper environmental composer so taking all this data from environmental economic political social systems so we're not just trying to create something that sounds nice we're also trying to create something that's resilient and that's because we're working with a big project alvalal it's called the team at alvalal are doing major works on on landscape restoration so the idea is that we contribute through that work to build resilience and so those are the elements we have to look at you know what are the economic systems what do they sound like and how do we work with those political not so much that's harder but yes yeah, social cultural and those are the elements that we have to bring into this as well as the sounds of biodiversity as a result of that we've created what we call the sound systems resilience framework and that's where we use different musical or different sound parameters to design the landscape so the balance of the landscape the fidelity of the landscape the harmonics and so we use these terms as a way to design and those become the fundamental elements and what we want to do is create an actual toolkit a process so that other people who are interested in soundscape design can replicate it that's the whole idea of this initial project is to come out with tools and processes which people can then understand the fundamental elements to use to do this soundscape restoration. My last question is one that occurred to me, I suppose, as you were speaking then. It kind of comes full circle back to your experiences in Australia, and I suspect it might be tied in with your kind of love for the didgeridoo. When you were talking, I thought to myself, well, just the landscape, and again, I'm going to probably highlight my lack of knowledge when it comes to music and sound, but is it possible that the landscape feeds into the music that comes out of a culture? Because I was thinking about instruments and just the kind of sounds that you're surrounded by, does it affect obviously the music that you produce, but I suppose all sorts of arts that come out of a culture? 100%, 100%. And Interesting. This is what we, we actually explore on the arts and ecology course down at Dartington, very much that of, you know, how does the landscape basically influence the art or that you create? And it's so important, you know, throughout human history, landscape has had such a profound impact. And you're absolutely right. Didgeridoo, didgeridoo is of the land. And so many of the rhythms that are played are very much about the earth processes the the processes shaping country as as it's called so yeah 100 percent. and well in spain flamenco if you look at the roots of flamenco very much to do with the landscape and also people's relationship to the landscape and i think that's again what we're trying to do here is make people aware that the landscape isn't passive it's not a bystander. It has something to say. And again, coming back to the work I do in Dartington, we've been exploring this idea of how you can actually collaborate with the more than human world. And I've literally just got back from a two week intensive where we were trying to do this. And it's difficult. But this heightened awareness that you're not just working with a dead, inert landscape. That landscape has got agency. It's alive. You know, if you think about contemporary animism, this idea that it's all alive and listening connects us to that life, to that aliveness, perhaps more than any other sense. You know, when we listen, you know, we listen to the sound of wind through trees, we listen to water. That's not dead. That's truly alive and it's telling a story. But we've removed ourselves so profoundly that 
we don't hear that voice anymore. That's what Sound Matters is trying to do is to say, look, the more than human world is telling a story. And it's a story that we have to listen to again if we are to survive and thrive. I mean, if you just look at the world at the moment, the mess we're in, and that's largely because we've lost the ability to listen and we've lost the ability to connect. And if we can start reconnecting through active listening, I think we can solve a lot of these crises. But to do that, is difficult and it requires a change of perception. That's why, for me, playing didgeridoo connected me intimately to that landscape. It helped me understand the processes shaping that. The work of Sound Matters is all about just opening people's ears, opening their bodies to the possibility that you know there are different stories being told, and and we need to listen to those. Thank you very much to Mike for joining me and speaking about something so unusual but relevant. And thanks to you for joining me on this ride through horticulture. I'm aware it's sometimes a wild one. Playing You Out Now is a piece of music produced by Sound Matters, using four different soil parameters measured at an eco-restoration camp over five years. The parameters measured were soil nutrient values, moisture, temperature and microbial activity, and these translated through into various sonic components. This is the result.
can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.